America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt on August the 29th, year of our Lord, 2022. I am live at Studio North as uh, the cars begin to tilt out of Maine and head south. I stayed off the highways as the great exodus begins. I don't go back to the Beltway until um, well, late October. I love fall up here. I will be back in the Beltway. I should correct that. I will be back inside the Beltway for a few days. I'm going to be meeting with the uh, Hill Boys and carrying a bunch of uh, Salem people about the electoral season ahead. But I do want to run down. Uh, let's start with the news on this, the first Monday of what is officially the last week of everybody's summer, although I thought last week was the official last week. Most people said, you're right, but a few people disagreed. Hunter Biden, border crossings <clears throat> and COVID policies face new scrutiny if GOP wins the House. Add to that the collapse in Afghanistan. House Republicans are preparing across the board investigations of the Biden administration if they take control next year. And the House Republicans are going to take control. There were a few stories this weekend trying to paint a little light into the very dark picture politically for Democrats. That's not going to work, especially when you hear the rest of the news. This student loan debacle has got millions of Americans fuming, angry, angry, angry. I have not yet talked to one person who would admit to supporting this called a raw vote buying by the Wall Street Journal, reckless by the Washington Post. Tim Bennett or Michael Bennett in Colorado, Cortez Masto in Nevada, Tim Ryan in Ohio. Democrats are fleeing from the thing because it strikes, well, millions of Americans as highly inequitable, as unfair to people who never went to college, people who went right to work, people who bought a truck or tools in the last five years to, to expand their business, make a living. It strikes people who paid off their loan as crazy. People who went to college on the GI Bill after they served four to six years in uniform it strikes parents who saved and students who worked as completely nuts. It's a deadbeat bailout. Deadbeat bailout. That's what it is. And uh, I'll be writing about it for the Post later today. From the Financial Times this morning, investors increase bets against euro as energy crisis intensifies. We're in for a long, long recession. Why do I say that? Putin invaded Afga invaded Ukraine after Biden's weakness in Afghanistan combined with the fiscal, it's not even irresponsibility, we need a new word for how completely awful, how completely awful the Biden year and a half have been uh, in terms of pumping money into an overheated economy. It began in his first month with the so-called American Rescue Act. Now, Democrats and Republicans alike back COVID relief under President Trump. It was necessary. PPP was necessary. I'll be the first to tell you, it uh, kept me. I was running the Nixon Library there, and we got a PPP grant. If we hadn't, I would have had to fire everyone. It's a museum that gets ticket revenue. The same thing happened across the United States, and it was forgiven. And I think the Democrats arguing, oh, but what about PPP? Is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. People know that PPP saved jobs of people. There was fraud by, by Democratic-run states, but no, most of the people who got it, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing, bipartisan. But we did not need the $2 trillion that Joe Biden spent in the American Rescue Act. We did not need the infrastructure bill, though that was bipartisan at least in the first year. Then came along another $700 billion last month, following the CHIPS Act, uh, $300 billion, which was bipartisan. And now comes along somewhere between $300 billion and a $1 trillion in student aid checks, gifts, golden rings for people. What a nightmare. Iran has threatened Israel this morning. They say that they will not enter into a new, de new nuclear deal if the International Atomic Energy Agency probe continues. That from the Times of Israel. Uh, why are we dealing with these people? Because Joe Biden does not have a foreign policy other than appeasement. It is appeasement, by the way, that led to the... Uh, collapse of Afghanistan, and that led to the invasion of Ukraine by Putin. Joe Biden's weakness is provocative everywhere, which is why Europe is going to be dark, cold, and bring down the world economy this winter. It's already starting to tumble. Uh, the redacted affidavit came out Friday, as I suspected, as I said on Brett Fair's show on Thursday night. Here it is. I've got all of it. I've read all of it. The redacted. It doesn't have, there, there, there's a good example of a page. If you're watching on the Salem News Channel, there's a good example of a page. It's blacked out. By the way, also blacked out today will be coverage of Uncle Tom 2, which took off like a rocket at SalemNow.com over the weekend. That's been blacked out. But that's the affidavit. Still, I went through it and I gleaned everything they say, everything they allege, 
they either know or don't know to be true now because they got the documents. Right? So they, they have all of the Trump documents from Mar-a-Lago. Uh, the only additional thing to holding classified material in violation of law, which they can either prove or not prove based upon the president and the documents, and they don't want to bring that case because the president's going to say he disclassified everything and they're going to have an amazing problem um, lining that up. I can't wait for the discovery on that. Tell me again what the Kennedys took. Tell me again what Johnson took. Oh, the Presidential Record Act after Nixon. That changed everything. Okay, let's, tell, let's talk about Ford. Then let's talk about what Carter took. Then let's talk about what H.W. took. Then let's talk about what Clinton took, including the furniture, including the tapes in his sock during then gave back. Then let's talk about W. Then let's talk about Obama. What did Obama take? What did all the Obama people take? It'd be quite the defense put up there. They're not going to bring that case. It's all a sham. The only thing they've got in there is obstruction, and we'll see if they come up with any obstruction. Trump legal team says redacted affidavit raises more questions than it answers. Of course it does. That's in the wall in the uh, Fox News. For those of you who did not get student loan forgiveness, you should know that McKinsey, Bain, and the Boston Consulting Group are raising their starting pay to $175,000 to up to $192,000. That's the starting pay. First year consultants at McKinsey, Bain, and, and BCG. They're also eligible to receive up to $250,000 total in bonuses in their first year, but they're all eligible for student loans because it's based on your AGI, your adjusted gross income in 2022. And they'll all make less than 250,000 a spouse. So that, that, that couple who are going off to bang consulting together, we're going to make a half million dollars next year. They're going to get $40,000 from the government this year. How's that strike you? Intelligence officials will assess Mar-a-Lago document damage. What nonsense? What other non nonsense? The judge, however, signals intent to appoint special master in the Mar-a-Lago search. That's what Donald Trump asked for. Now, the New York Times wanted to go up, drove off the highway down the road and made a right turn to tell you that the judge involved in this case was appointed by Donald Trump. They don't do that in other cases. Oh, by the way, one of Joe Biden's programs in the Rescue Amer American Rescue Act, millions in COVID aid went to retrain veterans. Only 397 veterans landed jobs. That's a Democratic program for you. Good news, two United States Navy warships have entered the Taiwan Strait in the first U.S. Navy transit of the waterway since Pelosi went to Taiwan. Uh, I'm going to play the tape of this in the third segment. FBI responds to Mark Zuckerberg claims in Joe Rogan's show. I do not know why Zuck went on Joe Rogan. It was bound. Joe was a very good interviewer. And it went on for two hours or something like that. And one piece came out about Hunter Biden and the FBI. I'll tell you about it. Wall Street Journal has a story on it. Zuck and Hunter, Bi and Hunter Biden's laptop. Uh, the Iran deal is looming, according to the Times of Israel. It's coming down in four days, in coming down in four parts, all of which will be operating within 165 days. It's a nightmare. Hezbollah chief meets with Hamas officials days after the sit-down with the Islamic Jihad leader. That means, of course, that they're going to get trillions of dollars from us in sanctions relief, and they're going to give it to Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah. The moment Rishi Sunak's team knew his leadership dream was over. Look, Liz Truss is the newest prime minister. Let's get there. Then the Telegraph, I'll come back to this, how decades of complacency have left Germany facing a cold, dark winter. They shut down their nuclear plants. They had no idea. And then the story of little Liza killed in her stroller by a Russian missile in Ukraine. Please, friends, it's my last week of my drive to help Ukraine. Help Ukraine banner is at the top of HughHewitt.com. Tens of thousands of dollars have been raised, hundreds of thousands across the Salem platforms in this sponsored campaign. Please go there. It's the last three days of my Food for the Poor campaign. Head over to HughHewitt.com. At the very top, there is a banner. You cannot miss it. Uh, when we come back, I will tell you a little bit more about it, or you can call 855-359-HOPE. And he's written this new book, The Death of Learning. How American Education Has Failed Our Students and What to Do About It, and I Think You Need to Get the Death of Learning. Let me read you his official bio, though. John Agresto has taught at the University of Toronto, Kenyon College, Duke University, Wabash College, and the New School University. He was a scholar at the National Humanities Center in North Carolina and later served in senior positions at the National Endowment for Humanity. He was president of St. John's College in Santa Fe for 11 years. In 2003, Agresto went to Iraq as the Senior Advisor for Higher Education and Scientific Research for the Coalition Provisional Authority. Between 2007 and 2010, he occupied roles including Academic Dean, Provost, and Chancellor 
of the American University in Iraq. Really, John Agresto ought to be just known as the husband of Kathy, but he joins me now. Good morning, John. How are you? Thank He's you. Not e Thank you for that. Were you on mute? Were you on mute? No. Okay, I'm just what John Agresto does funny things. He does do marvelous cooking things. And if anything else, besides being the husband of Kathy, he should be known as a chef. John, can I tell one story before we dive into the death of learning? Oh, I'm afraid you can. Oi. Oi. Well, I want the, the, the John's hometown, Brooklyn, comes up early in the death of learning. And I'm going to talk about uh, Father John Allen and Sister Mary Gerald in a moment. But John is the guy who took me on my most memorable subway ride ever, leaving Midtown <laughs> with our dear friend Susan Metz, who is dressed in heels and a, probably a St. John suit. John and I had on coats and ties. And on a Sunday morning, we rode from Midtown to Coney Island. And on the way back, as we went through Red Hook, we were approached by a New York Transit City police officer who said, what are you three doing on this train? And then he said, I'm riding with you back to Midtown. Because, John, he thought we were out of our mind to go through your old neighborhood. Oh, and he was. He was right. He was right. <laughs> Oh, no, I'll never forget Susan being being there on the beaches of Coney Island dressed in heels. In heels. We were at Nathan's getting a hot dog, and she had heels on. You're right. John, <laughs> I love the death of learning. And I have said, I believe you were Alan Bloom's student, yep. that Alan Bloom saw the explosion coming, and from the 35 years ago with the closing of the American mind, and that you stand on the other side of the blast crater looking at the ruins you were a student 35 years later, and you're talking among the ruins, is there any hope of rebuilding? Is that a fair summary? I, I think that's a fair summary. I mean, I, I'm embarrassed that you you connect me with a bloom. He was a giant. He wrote a book called Giants and Dwarfs. I'm the dwarf. He's the giant. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that's a fair summary. I'm trying to figure out where the heck we go from here. He was a prophet, John. I, get, I go back to thinking about it. And I first heard Alan Bloom in 1978. He came to Harvard and gave a lecture on the Emil, which I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. But he was famous. And then he comes out with the closing of the American mind in 1987. It changes the conversation, but it did not stop the deterioration. Right. Right. So here is the subject that we're going to talk about. In one recent year of 300,000 undergraduate college degrees, only 37,000 in philosophy, English, and history combined. That's from the death of learning. This very moment, not 15 minutes ago, Ajit Pai, the former chairman of the FCC and a genius, pointed us to a thread on college majors, which notes, among other things, that, quote, the total outlier of computer science's explosion is really clear here. So is the concentration and growth in fields that have clear career prospects. And he hat tips Andy Gruel, and he quotes at Benjamin Stiff, uh, Schmidt on STEM medical majors and computer science taking over the university, the humanities, the social sciences, even businesses have plummeted. John, why? Oh, God, there are so many reasons you you know this. Uh, I think to, to get to the cut to the chase, uh, I think there's an awful lot. Uh, not the, uh, Everybody says the death of the, of the humanities, the uh, death of the liberal arts is due to uh, uh, people wanting to make money, uh, commercialism of America, materialism, they're all out for a buck. Nobody, everybody knows, and it's true, it's hard to make a living in, you know, by studying, the, studying great books or the liberal arts. It's easier to make money in engineering or business, and now it's easier to make a lot of money, has been for a while, in, in pharmaceuticals and in, and, in, and in the medical field and, and healthcare. Uh, so that's part of it. But the part I really wanted to concentrate on, uh, partly because I actually like those other fields. I like engineers. I like people who are in computer engineering and computer science. I like people who are in agronomy and people who are in, in, in marketing and sales. You know, they're, they're fine, upstanding people. Uh, uh, what I really wanted to concentrate on was how the liberal arts didn't die because they were murdered. They died because of suicide. Nobody wants to take these courses, not because, not only because you can't get a, uh, a high-paying job in the aerotech industry if you if you major in medieval poetry, uh, but yeah, but but that we we have said uh, these these uh, studies of ours uh, are effete. 
uh, not in so many words. We raise we raise the intellectual elites, and we uh, we do if we did that would be fine. But we don't. Uh, the 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 liberal arts. Uh, who wants to take a? I could see taking a course on Shakespeare. Uh, would love to see students do that. But when the courses on Shakespeare have to do with Shakespeare's abuse of women, or was Shakespeare a closet homosexual, or whatever the the, uh, the the cause of the day is in the liberal arts, people say, I think I'll just forget about that. Maybe I'll major in maybe I'll major in in in, in one of the STEM fields. Accounting, I can always fall back on accounting if I can do a ledger. The depth of learning. By the way, John Agresto never took a marketing class in his life. If he had, he would have mentioned the depth of learning seven times because of the Luntz rule, which is if you don't say the title of a book, The Death of Learning, seven <laughs> times in every interview, then no one will remember The Death of Learning and they won't buy it from Amazon. So Dr. Agresto never took a marketing course in his life. Susan Metz and I were in charge of teaching him how to promote The Death of Learning and other things. And we have failed, obviously. Dr. John. Yes. That's what they called you in Kurdistan, right, Dr. Yes. John? Yes, they did. I'm calling you Dr. John forever now because oh, my the university, the American University went from 45 students to 1,600 in Kurdistan, and they teach the liberal arts, whereas under Saddam Hussein, they only learn the technical arts, correct? Yeah, they, uh, he, you know, he, he had a great, he, even though he had a PhD in, his, in, in, in literature, in English, actually, uh, so I was told. Uh, it was a PA. He never wrote his own dissertation. He he made others write it for him. Uh, uh, he uh, he had he had what he knew he needed. He needed people who were who would be doctors, who would be uh, accountants, uh, who would be in finance and marketing, uh, uh, who would be in pharmacy. Uh, and so, no, the liberal arts for him, the liberal arts were as so many in this country want it to be. Uh, a vehicle for the promotion of his ideology. Uh, now, I, I especially want Archbishop Chapu, who is listening right now, because uh, he listens every morning to hear this. You are the product of Catholic schools. Father yes. John Allen is cited, and we'll talk about that. Sister Mary Gerald is responsible for you being a PhD accomplished scholar because she persuaded your father, because you pointed out in 1950s Brooklyn, sisters had more authorities than fathers, to go to an elite school where you learned, but I want him to know, you say religious education and liberal education are not at war with each other. Honest to God, religious education, civic education, uh, uh, professional and, 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 and technical education are not at war with the liberal arts. And in fact, if we want to talk about diversity, it would be wonderful if people who are in, in, uh, in, uh, more technical or, or more marketable fields had greater love of the liberal arts. And reversely, if people in the liberal arts would have some respect for uh, professors of business, professors of law, uh, there's an awful lot to be learned there. I learned, I learned as much from, from uh, Julia Child as I learned from Alan Bloom. I got to tell you that. Well, that, and you did. By the way, John is an excellent chef. But the last time I had dinner with him, he prepared sea bass, which was a home run with the fetching Mrs. Hewitt, but I said, meh. All right, so <laughs> what do Father Allen and Sister Mary Gerald have in common with Lincoln, citing Gray's elegy? Uh, where are you going with that question? What do they have in common with Lincoln? Uh, uh, well, first, let's talk about Lincoln. Lincoln really loved poetry. Lincoln really loved the Bible, uh, although I think he... he there are parts of it that made him scratch his head and say, this simply can't be right. But he thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. Uh, there is no Lincoln speech that isn't a poem. Uh, some of them that are even more than poems. I think like the Gettysburg Address, I think it's actually a prayer. I think it's actually a liturgical prayer. He learned everything he could to be a statesman. Uh, in other words, a person who knows where he wants to go and has the rhetorical skills to lead others there. Uh, he learned all of that from poetry, from the Bible, from Shakespeare. He absolutely, uh, Shakespeare was a, a faddish at the time, uh, but he didn't take it as a fad. He took it as a vehicle to find out the truth about enduring human issues. Uh, he, he was a, a, a voracious reader of important texts, and he thought, and he thought, and he thought. Uh, 
Jefferson was, as it is to me, uh, probably the most important American thinker uh, that that he uh, that he had ever seen, and he devoured Jefferson, uh, loved him. So, uh, but he did not read the classics, as you point out. In the no, Death he did I mean, they were. Uh, he may have read. Uh, he he may have read some. Uh, well, there were classic things like Aesop's Fables that he knew. Uh, I do not know that he ever read one uh, uh, Greek tragedy. I don't know that he ever read. I'm sure he'd never read the Odyssey or the Iliad. Uh, he was, uh, and he knew, as far as I know, no language other than English. So uh, my answer to my own question: What do Father Al and Sister Mary Gerald Lincoln have in column? They knew that the most important thing was to search wisely for the most important thing. They knew how to. And by the way, the Archbishop, you, you, every book about education by anyone I respect in America always says the important thing is that you learn for yourself how to seek wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, number one. Number two, not assume that you or your friends or a Google search will give it to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and that, was the, that was the promise of the liberal arts. A, we knew we had the best books. And B, we knew we had not the answers to the world's, we had some of the answers to the world's most important questions, uh, but we had ways of understanding not only uh, important issues, but the different alternative answers to those issues, and we were given the tools to weigh those answers. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we became smarter about things that matter if we studied history and literature, uh, philosophy, and the classics. Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what Lincoln knew. That's what when Madison we, knew. We have to go to break. When we come back, Dr. Gresto and I are going to continue talking about the death of learning. You need to buy this book if you're a high school teacher, a high school principal, a college administrator, or about to go to college, or just want to be living the well-lived life. I've got to say, the back flaps gave rise to a column that I wrote for the Washington Post two weeks ago after reading The Death of Learning. I was writing down books that mattered to me, books that no one assigned that I read on my own that mattered to me. It became because John Agresto makes the persuasive case for reading, and it became a Washington Post column that one of my editors said everyone should write this column. The books that mattered to you, one of them is The Death of Learning. Go to Amazon.com right now during the break. Agresto is not hard to spell. A G R E S T O, John Agresto. I'll be back to talk with my friend and the author of The Death of Learning after this. Welcome back, America. Over the last two weeks, I have been pondering John Agresto's new book, The Death of Learning. I really believe everyone in education, every student, every principal, every college teacher, every college administrator ought to read The Death of Learning right now. And everyone who presumes to teach, who gives a homily or a sermon, should read The Death of Learning. It's about the liberal arts. Page 131, the definition John Agresto gives of it. The liberal arts are a way of understanding the most important questions of human concern through reason and reflection. Uh, Dr. John, as your Iraqi students called you, why is there a letter to high school teachers and principals in an appendix? And why is there a letter to high school seniors in the appendix? Because those are... I just wrote another essay. I had published, I forget where, and oh, Real Career Politics took it up. Uh, that the book actually began with that letter to high school teachers. Uh, they were my main concern. And as I say there, if, if, if students do not get exposed to the liberal arts in high school, uh, they will never look at the liberal arts. They will never have an appreciation for the language, for literature, uh, for, for, for classic texts, uh, for history, uh, that, the, that the preservation of learning re requires not the specialization you get in college and the research projects that your professors have. It requires teachers who love French, who love Latin, who love, who love uh, history, who love American history, who love European history, who love Shakespeare. That's where the, that's where the locus of civilization is today. Uh, and so I began with that. And then I expanded out the rest of the book uh, to talk about uh, uh, colleges and universities. Uh, but I really put a, I, with all the burdens high school teachers have on them these days, I added another one. You are the bearers of civilization. Whether you, whether you know it or not, you count more than professors do. High school matters more than college, in my view, in creating citizens. Yes. And I believe your book, The Death of Learning, makes that point. I have to say as well, 
After I got out of Harvard, I went to work for David Eisenhower and then Richard Nixon, putting my liberal education to work as a ghostwriter and as a researcher. And when President Nixon published the book I worked on, The Real War, his favorite review called The Real War a creed de cour to the West. I think, and I had to look that up because I don't know anything about French. <laughs> I think the death of learning is a creed de cour, John Agresto. Do you agree? Oh, God, you are so sweet to me. You are just incredible. Uh, and not only that, you're a good marketer. I got to tell you, you not only mentioned my, the name of the book 18 times, you actually gave them my name and how to spell it. I can't believe this, you. You're wonderful. But uh, is it a creed de cour? Yes, of course yes. it is. Of course it is. Uh, right tell the Steeler heart. fans what that means. Say that again, you. Say to the Steeler fans, explain to the Steeler fans in my audience, because we're on in Pittsburgh. From the heart. It's a, a cry from the heart. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it says, come on, this is, uh, this is not just an intellectual exercise. Uh, this is me trying to tell you from my heart, from my, uh, from my heart and my head together, uh, what it is we have to do to save civilization and culture. Uh, and, uh, and, and not only save it, but expand it, promote it, uh, make it even better. Uh, I'm not, uh, I, get, I get some, some flack from, from people and, and, and my, my, all my conservative friends who say, well, yeah, really, this, is, this isn't really telling us how to go back to what we had in the 50s. I said, no, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about to take, to take the essence of learning and to see how we can make it our own and, and improve on it. Uh, uh, but not improve on it the way people in the universities think they, they're improving on it now. They are just making shambles of it. You And Dr. John, with the exception of Oberlin, the University of Minnesota, Colorado College, you really don't target anyone. You are not angry. This is not about settling scores or telling people who's bad. It's about what do we do to, to come reason together? And And the tone of the book, by the way, is so welcoming that anyone who reads it will finally under who hates Trump, they will finally understand why Trump. It's not Trump is not in this book. He is never mentioned. Nope. But I I think it is the perfect explanation for the phenomenon that is the 2016 election. When you talk about the stigmatization of the ordinary, what do you think of my my political assessment? Although it's not a political book, it doesn't do any politics. It's about learning. But I think you maybe unintentionally explained how Donald Trump won. Yeah, uh, although, uh, and, I, and I, you're right, I mentioned no political names. I certainly don't mention Trump. Uh, I have less of an opinion of Trump than you do. You, I uh, think everybody or our friends together know that. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the left doesn't quite understand. Uh, you know, the liberal arts used to be said, and, and Alan Boone would say this most directly, it's made for you to sort of uh, understand or what your parents, where your parents went wrong, where your culture is wrong, where America went wrong, where the world went wrong, where philosophy went wrong. And I'm saying, you know, uh, first you have to understand it before you criticize it. And I'm sorry, uh, Western civilization, American history, I, I, get, I get so riled up with, you know, all this talk about Jefferson being, uh, being nothing but a hypocrite and a, and a slaver. Uh, yeah, both of those are true. He was a hypocrite. He would say so himself. Why? Why? What led Jefferson to make this fight in his own soul over what he knew he had to do and, and what he knew was right? More on that after the break. John and I will talk for another 20 minutes, which will be on today's podcast, Highly Concentrated Hugh, in a couple of hours. Go get the depth of learning. Come back and listen to the rest of my conversation with Dr. John Agresto author of The Death of Learning. I'll be back tomorrow, America, on the next Hugh Hewitt Show. I am back now with Dr. John Agresto, continuing the conversation about this book, The Death of Learning. You can only hear this on the podcast, Highly Concentrated Hugh, though I may play parts of it tomorrow. Dr. John, um, when I mention, I, I've got to make sure in our, in our 18 minutes that are left that I tell people what I mean by my comment about Trump. You talk about the stigmatization of the ordinary, quote, the relentless attacks upon efforts to exile, cancel or penalize the common views of right and wrong held by ordinary citizens, their everyday questions and concerns, their pride in country and the ethics promoted by conventional Western religious understandings. Page 93, page 95, the most ordinary things, ordinary questions, ordinary views are disdained, ridiculed and often condemned. Page 103, 
There is a target on the Hellenic Judeo Enlightenment tradition. These these are realities that are felt in America that made them angry with elites, and anger gave rise to Trump. That's my theory. Even though the death of learning, I, I didn't read it with any expectation of getting a political message, but an education. But I walked away saying what people have been trying to explain for seven years is explained in a book that never mentions Trump. Ordinary Americans are are distanced from elite culture in a way that began when the liberal arts crushed, crashed. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Hugh, that's so true. Uh, I, there are two conjoined chapters there. The one on the uh, uh, on the attack on, on on the high, which means uh, we all know this: the 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 elite attack on elite learning, uh, or to put it differently. Uh, why why Shakespeare is not a required course in, in, in for English majors in so many universities. Uh, you know, we have trouble, quote-unquote, with Shakespeare. Uh, uh, why the Bible uh, is not uh, treated as something that, that every student in this culture should know something about. Uh, it's just incredible. So there's been an attack on the high. All the great great artists, great poets, great dramatists, great philosophers, uh, great statesmen, they've all been deep dethroned. That's the, the attack on the high is, is a, a serious problem. And, and that's where so many people on the right, uh, intellectuals on the right, concentrate. You know, the attack on great books. Uh, I wanted to take it further. It's not only the attack on the high, it's the attack on the ordinary, the attack on the everyday, the attack on what, what, what my father thought, what my mother thought, what your father and mother thought, what your aunts and uncles thought, the attack on what the country takes for granted. Now, some of that may be wrong. You know, maybe we really should rethink our, our, our ways. But an awful lot of that may be right. And we better uh, put it this way. I have no love for critical race theory. Do I think it should be banned in school? I think it's an opportunity. I don't, you know, there used to be the old sappy saying, you know, uh, all, all problems are, are opportunities in disguise. It's an opportunity to do what? To teach Madison, to read Tocqueville, uh, to understand uh, Jefferson, to understand the beginnings of the United States, maybe in 1619, although I sincerely doubt it, but in 16, 1776 and 1789, uh, uh, at 1787 and 89, uh, an opportunity to read the most, uh, to read the Federalist Papers, to read Democracy in America, to to understand what was being tried to, to be, how the framers uh, struggled with combining popular rule with the defense of liberty, and then trying to understand liberty in ways that were were uh, not not sort of insane, but but rational uh, and productive. Uh, to understand the place of, of what we come to call capitalism, to understand the place of free enterprise in our system, or to understand that's the opportunity to understand ordinary things. Uh, yeah, Dr. Arndt, long after I am gone and long after this radio show is over, the only thing that will be remembered is the hour a week that I spend with Dr. Larry Arndt. Now, Dr. Arndt is a West Coast Drowsian and you are an East Coast Drowsian, but you are both great like teachers. Terms, so I know. But you are, you are both great teachers. And my point is, once a week, he comes on in the Hillsdale Dialogue, and we spend an hour talking about the lasting and important thing. Maybe we just finish the ethics. Ten weeks on the ethics on commercial radio. It just doesn't happen very often. But what he and you would agree on is that the liberal arts should not be in the service of any political or partisan stance, whether Tory or Whig, liberal, conservative, Marxist, left-wing, or libertarian. That's a direct quote from page 14. You are not pushing an agenda. You aren't pushing Hillsdale or St. John's. You aren't nope, pushing nope, anything. Nope. You are nope. pushing a way of learning, curiosity, but um, in the service of wisdom. I think that's a fair summary. Yeah, and, and it has a uh, conservative, and you, you mentioned that, that chapter, stigmatization, the stigmatization of the ordinary. And most people say, oh boy, you are, you are really mad in that chapter. I say, no, the truth is I'm really sad in that chapter. Uh, I, I, you know, that, that, that now Columbus has become the enemy. And I don't say that as an Italian-American. You know, I have nothing against having Indigenous Peoples Day. I just have a problem with it supplanting Columbus Day, 
We can't have, uh, I have no trouble with the kind of multiculturalism that says, let's look at the East, let's look at Islam, let's look at, uh, I, I certainly believe we should look at, at Roman and Greek antiquity. Why? Because they're different than we are. They are diverse from us. Uh, that's the real promise of the classics, that we see wonderful people who don't think the way we think. Uh, but, but the destruction of all that, uh, the destruction of the ordinary, uh, uh, this makes me sad more than it makes me mad, although it does get me, I guess, riled up when I talk to you about it. Well, I want to go back as well to The War on the High, because this is an unusual book, The Death of Learning. There's a little bit of Augustine's Confessions in here, a little bit of Montaigne, in that um, a big explosion occurred in 1997 at Stanford, and it was the original sort of Alan Bloom saw it coming, John Agresto admits to having funded it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you were, there, so, were you there with me at that time? I don't think so. Name. I don't think I had anything to do with funding the Stanford <laughs> University grant. I, I deny. I was there for the Africans, uh, the, the PBS series that went off the rails that you had to get our name off of, along with Dr. Lynn Cheney. I have to tell people, though, when you own up, to complicity in one of the bombs, um, and you didn't intend it to be a bomb, it's just you sold some dynamite to people you thought were going to build a bridge, and they didn't, they blew the old one up. Um, I think it's honest, because a lot of people have their fingerprints on what's happened to the humanities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, uh, and I had to do that, although you do have to tell the audience that I did it in a footnote. Uh, but Footnotes are the best thing in this book. You name the names in the footnote, Oberlin University of Minnesota, Colorado College, and others. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, you know, the, the, the publisher uh, wanted to put the, the notes in the back, and I said, no, nobody goes to read the notes in the back. Uh, I want people to see, see what I'm saying at the bottom of the page. And we grumbled over that, but we did it. Uh, in fact, I'm a little sad that the, the letter to high school students and the letter to the high, high school teachers uh, is in a, uh, both in appendices, and my essays on, on on Latin and Greek, and my essays on on Abraham Lincoln, and my essays on Jefferson are all in the back of the book. But 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 Rousseau put all the important stuff in appendices too, so I'm in good company. I I believe, by the way, that the essay on Lincoln is the high water mark of the book uh, because yeah. it does put Lincoln, and you wrote that decades ago. Yeah. I do want to make sure I ask you though. Doctor Kissinger is my guest a couple of weeks back. He's written a new book that has a new appendix. He's 99 years old. He wrote it when he was 98. He is completely a pessimist because the age of image has supplanted the age of books. Nobody reads. And by nobody, I mean 95% of college students do not read books. You say, read books not to learn what the author's context is, but read books for what they tell you. And I don't know. And Dr. Kissinger just doubts whether or not anybody really reads seriously anymore, Dr. Agresto. Do you agree with him? Dr. John, remember the rule. Dr. John, Dr. John, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, how I know this. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I have grandchildren. I have four grandkids. Uh, they, they're on their phones all the time. They're on, they're on the Internet all the time. Uh, uh, my, my granddaughter, my youngest of the four, uh, reads uh, j- these Japanese anime books, uh, and th- that's what's getting her into reading. She was reading Diary of a Wimpy Kid for a while, uh, uh, but she gave she gave up on those for these anime books. Reading is, I don't know how you get kids interested in these things, but don't forget what the, it's even worse, because the books I'm talking about aren't easy. I mean, I mean wh- what did we grow up on? Not easy books. I mean, we grew up on Gulliver's Travels. We grew up on on the Narnia series. We grew up on on uh, uh, any number of C.S. Lewis texts. We grew talk up on, about Penrod because you do throughout the book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a very lightweight book. Penrod, Penrod and Sam, Boots Tarkington's books from the early 1900s, uh, and uh, uh, no, no kid is going to read those anymore. Uh, and those are not heavy books. I mean, you don't have to you don't have to delve into uh, you know. Sure, uh, Aeschylus and, 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 and Plato uh, for an education. You could just read for all, you read for all kinds of things. And Penrod and Sam, you don't read that for philosophy. Uh, you read that for A, entertainment, which is important, but B, more important, to show you what, the, what, the, what it means to be an imaginative person. Now, I do believe that Harry Potter is a gateway drug to serious reading. I'm very, very pleased, my grandchildren. 
Uh, I think that's an excellent point, too. Excellent point, yes. And, and I am trying to order Bronk Burnett books for my grandson who plays baseball because I also think, and he's younger than, than Harry Potter, seventh and eighth book yet, or fifth and sixth book. But Dr. Agresta, before we, I want to step back. You say, do not be afraid of naive questions. Exactly. That's actually the starting point for education. We've got six minutes left uh, on a podcast that might lead people to buy The Death of Learning. That might be the key to it. They don't have to know much to read The Death of Learning, but they might be inspired to learn a lot more if they read it. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Uh, is there a question in that? Uh, yes, uh, I always make statements and then ask people to respond, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn my, question into a, my statement into a question. Why not be afraid of naive questions? I'm always ready to say, I don't know that. What are you talking about? Oh, okay. Oh, I probably say I don't know more often than I say, well, here's the answer. In fact, I know I say it more often than I say Here's the answer to that. That's why you, know, you will not penetrate even the deepest thinker unless you say, Aristotle, I, I don't understand. Could you, could you ex try to explain it to me? And then the other thing that leads to is conversations with your students, conversations in your book club, conversations where you say, what, what's she getting at here? What's she trying to tell us? What should I get out of this and why? Why is this important? Uh, uh, and uh, just uh, just don't don't say well. Uh, I remember doing a class on the Iliad uh, and with adults, and they all were terrified that I was going to ask them to explain the you know the monetary system of ancient Troy or or how triremes were built or whatever foolishness. They, and I said, you know, you got the scal Helen. You got the you, you you got you got the Trojans who are stolen Helen. Uh, you got the Greeks or the uh, the Achaeans who are coming to to, to take her back. Uh, it's causing death and destruction, uh, and 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 she's nothing but a problem for Troy. So I said, the question is, why don't they just give her back? Yeah, Achilles raged. Uh, all right, here's why I want to finish, Doctor uh -huh. Gresto. You, I am eternally grateful that my three children had great high school teachers. I mean, great civics teachers for the boys, great history teachers for the girl, great high school teachers make all the difference. You had this memorable figure, Father John Allen, very memorable, and Sister Mary Gerald. What do they need to know that they've got to do? The high school teachers? Yes. Uh, they have to, number one, they have to, uh, first they have to love their kids, uh, and they have to love their books. And they have to love ideas, and they have to love uh, they have to love literature. They have to love the sound of words on a page. Uh, uh, they they and they have to say we are going to ask naive questions because that's what you have. Kids have all these questions. Most of them are we might even say childlike. Uh, uh, and I don't mean like why is the sky blue? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, but you know why why did why did Jefferson say? All men are created equal, and yet he had slaves. Yes. Uh, ask that question. Don't say, oh, because he, uh, he was a creature of his time where they all had slaves. That doesn't answer the question for me. Why did he have slaves then? Would he have them now? If not, why? I want to know why. Uh, and, and find out what we really mean by all men are created equal. What we mean by liberty. What all we mean by rights. Ask, we think we know the answers to these things. We don't not without thinking about them for a long time. And the truth is, kids have, they don't want to know the intricacies of the construction of the Globe Theater. They want to know why is Shylock seem to be such a horrible person and at the same time be so sympathetic a person. Uh, they, they, that's what they want to know. What should, I remember in high school just memorizing page after page of Shakespeare a, for the, to understand the beauty of the language and to try to get out for myself what in the world this Mr. Shakespeare was trying to say. You know, you, you quote the entirety of Lincoln's farewell speech to Springfield. Yes. And it, it is marvelous how you, you pose it. Let's, let's close on Lincoln. All honor to Jefferson. I always say all honor to Lincoln. The second inaugural is a prayer, and it has in it one of the most memorable questions about if the Lord God ordains that we have to shed a an ounce of blood for every ounce taken by the whip, the lash, I believe, over the 300 years of slavery or 200 years of slavery, we will do so. I've never understood 
Lincoln's sense there. But that question I'll talk to anyone about. What was he saying? Where did he get that from? Did he really believe in in the Old Testament God, John? So uh, you're right. It's the questions you ask, not how many arcane facts you know about how many words are in the second inaugural and why they're on the Lincoln Memorial. It's what is he saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is he saying? Uh, how could he say that such a harsh thing that God wants wants blood for blood? And then at the same time, turn it around and say, it, it, that's God's judgment. He wants equal justice. Uh, you know, but we maybe we should think about binding up the wounds on both sides, you know, taking care of the widow and the orphan, uh, uh, that, there's a, that there's justice and there's mercy. And this is Lincoln trying to say, let's try to put the two things together. Dr. John Agresto, The Death of Learning is a magnificent work. I know you've been working on it for 30 years. Am I right? Oh, jeez. Yes, you don't remind me. <laughs> and, and you know what? Don't remind Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you come into the Beltway soon so we can renew our friendship again, as we always do at five-year intervals. And it's always like I just saw him yesterday. Dr. John Agresto, congratulations. Is, the Death of Learning is a significant book, and that's hard to do in these days. It's so good to talk to you, you, after all these all this time. You got it. Take t Be well, my friend, and say hello to Kathy from the Fetching okay, Mrs. Hewitt and I. Bye-bye, buddy. Bye-bye. Back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Uncle Tom, too, dropped over the weekend. I hope you go to SalemNow.com and watch this amazing sequel to Larry Elder's phenomenally successful Uncle Tom 1. This one's gotten even better reviews. And I, of course, was promoting it with Jared Kushner when he brought up the African-American members of Congress with whom he worked on the First Step Act. I called Uncle Tom's. I told Jared, go watch Uncle Tom 2. I hope he has. I'm joined now by the guy who's rapidly becoming the most objective man in Washington, D.C., Josh Kroshauer. And I don't say that to blow smoke. Josh worked for years for Roll Call. He's been on this show forever. He used to be a guest on the lowest rated show in MSNBC history, The Hugh Hewitt Show. But now he's moved on to bigger and better things. He's now over at Axios. He's on every show on television. And you can follow him at uh, on Twitter at Josh Kroshauer. Good morning, Josh. You know, Josh, I give you the highest compliment I do to people who want to be sort of traditional journalists like Dan Balls. I have no idea how you vote. Oh, well, appreciate it, Hugh. And, you know, I, the, the line that John Roberts uh, offered at his confirmation hearing, just calling the ball and the strike, that, that's how I view politics. That's how I report and, and analyze politics. So I, I do appreciate the, the, the compliment. Well, it's absolutely earned. Don't ever. I always tell people who play center field, stay in center field. Once you leave, no one thinks you're a center fielder ever, anymore. Once you've left one way or the other, I am not a center fielder. I'm a right fielder, right? And I think most people in media are left fielder. You and Brett Bear are in center field. In fact, we need – Brett's the catcher. We need a second baseman, and Josh is in center field. We'll figure out that second baseman. Uh, let me talk to you about student loans. Let me begin by asking you, straight up, and we haven't rehearsed, what is the political – response to Joe Biden's forgiveness program? Well, one of my favorite lines in assessing how, how the politics play on any given issue is which party is divided and which party is united. And every Republican from Mitt Romney to Josh Hawley are railing against this uh, the bailout, uh, the, the, the loan forgiveness of, of, of student loan uh, recipients, whereas the Democrats in the toughest races Democrats from very uh, diverse states like Nevada, Colorado, uh, Tim Ryan in Ohio, they came out within hours uh, railing against uh, or speaking out against this proposal. So that's all you need to know about the politics. When, when you have your own side, Paul Begala was on CNN. Uh, I, I, Paul's a partisan, but he often calls it like he sees it as well. And he railed against this plan as bad politics and bad policy. So, you know, when the Democratic Party, I mean, I actually talked to a very senior Democratic official a couple of days after this was proposed, and he said we were having the best week in the last year, and the White House stepped all over it. This is a political hot potato for us. At best case scenario, it's a wash. But you could be, I mean, the, the, the potential that Biden it really just framed the midterms on, on an issue of fairness, where we're, we're, we're basically Republicans or working class voters don't get anything. And you're, you're bailing out some of the more uh, affluent or people have the potential to be affluent college uh, 
graduates or, or college. It graduates. just so happens, Josh, um, the Hugh Hewitt Show magnificent staff. That would be me. Uh, I don't have a producer on this show. Uh, we are always alert to Paul Begala because Paul and I go out on the circuit together and ham and egg it in front of audiences through the Washington Speakers Bureau everywhere. I love working with Paul because I don't have to be funny. He's the funniest guy in Washington. Paul was on CNN and we got the clip you just referenced, cut number eight. Democrats, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a progressive. I want to help folks. But I think this is terrible policy. Politics, though, we saw. Tim Ryan is in a tough race in a tough state, and he can't stand this idea. Uh, Senator Warren is all for it. She's not exactly from a swing state in, in Massachusetts. Senator Catherine Cortez Masto from Nevada got a tough race. She doesn't like this. Uh, Michael Bennett, the senator from Colorado, he doesn't like this. Democrats, good Democrats. Sharice Davids, one of the more impressive Democrats, the only Democrat in Congress from Kansas. She doesn't like it. So what is my party doing with this? They're, they're, they're disadvantaging. I, I think they're not helping the, the people that we're here to help, which is poor people. Uh, and, and, and underprivileged communities, uh, and they're not helping their politicians who are running. I think Paul's completely correct. Let's <laughs> illustrate Josh's point with Marco Rubio on Fox Sunday show with Brian Kilmeade, cut number seven. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think that's what most people want. Look, there's three fundamental problems with this, okay? The first is there's no reform. Let's start with this. The, I've talked about the fact we need to reform student loans. I owed over $100,000 in student loans. The day I got elected to the Senate, I had over $100,000 still in student loans. That I was able to pay off because I wrote a book, and from that money I was able to pay it. If not, it would never. I'd still be paying. It, okay, so that's not about. I, I think the student loan thing in America is a big problem, and it's broken, and it needs to be fixed, and it needs to be reformed. And I have bipartisan ideas I've been pushing for years to do this. This plan doesn't reform the system. It doesn't change anything moving forward. There'll be people taking out loans right now that will owe them in the future that won't be covered by this. Oftentimes for a degree that won't lead to a job. Number two. That this is illegal. The president doesn't have the authority to do this. He's not, he's not an emperor. He can't just with the stroke of a pen cancel $300, $400 billion worth of student loans. And number three, it's unfair. 85% of the people in this country do not have a student loan. They either had one and paid it or they don't have one. And that 85% is going to pay for the 15% who got a tangible benefit. It may be too expensive. Maybe they're paying too high on interest. Maybe they borrowed too much. But they got a tangible benefit from that. And, and so now what you have is people that actually paid off their loans that feel like suckers, people that worked their way to school to not have loans who feel like suckers, and people who are, never went to college and are out there working hard to try to make ends meet, and they're woken in the newspaper to realize that you know, people who got these degrees and borrowed a bunch of money to go to an expensive school are having their debt wiped out, but their mortgage isn't, but their, their expenses aren't being wiped out. In fact, they're going up. So it's unfair, it's illegal, and it doesn't fix anything. So, Josh Kroshauer, Democrats thought they had a pulse in November when they won the special in upstate. And there are reasons I just don't believe that. But, uh, and I, I think they're spinning. But if they had a pulse, it's gone. Well, I think Rubio actually left off. Rubio focused on the fairness angle and the legal angle. There's also an inflation angle. Uh, this is a double whammy, uh, potentially, for inflation, not just on the macroeconomic inflation, Larry Summers, and Jason Furman, the former Obama officials, warning that this is going to worsen the inflation crisis that, that's already a big challenge for this administration. But this almost guarantees that you're going to see a tuition inflation at the big colleges, that they know that they're going to be able to raise tuition rates even more as a result of this, uh, as, as more of these loans are forgiven. So you know, that, 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 that undermines the whole intent of the policy to help working class or people struggling having the ability to pay for college. So it doesn't even, intend, it doesn't even help the people that it's designed to help in many ways, at least in the medium term. So the, the politics are very treacherous just because it hits a whole lot of angles. It hits the legal angle. It hits the fairness angle. It hits the inflation angle. And the only question is, can Republicans message this effectively? Uh, they, the American Action Network, a uh, House Republican uh, affiliated group, went up with an ad having uh, plumbers and landscapers uh, and chefs talking about how they were basically paying an art school student's education, and, and, and it was a very effective ad, I thought. It's gone up across the country nationwide. That's the type of message that Republicans are going to need to hammer home. They can't just rely on, on news coverage to do it for them. They're going to have to, these candidates are going to have to talk about this on their own uh, to, to score political points. And, and so far, they've struggled in some of these campaigns to get that message across. You know, the best anecdotes are personal anecdotes that are true that you know. Uh, when my son went off to the University of Cal Colorado, jokingly referred to in California at the University of California, Boulder. He had a good friend who went off to BMW school 
up in Montana or Wyoming somewhere where they teach you how to work on BMWs. And it takes a year and it costs money, but you're employed for life, right? You're employed for life. I don't know if they pay that off or not, or if, uh, if his friend Bobby paid for it out of pocket or whatever, but that's what he always wanted to do. He wanted to work on cars. I thought to myself, if you got out of high school and you bought a truck to go to work, or you bought some tools to join a job site, you are not the beneficiary of this, Josh Crosshower. I do. I think it's a nightmare for them. Tim Ryan made that very point. This is the Democrat running for the Senate in, in Ohio. He was on CNN, and he, he said that he's much more focused on helping working-class Ohioans get to technical school, get, a, get an actual skill. He, he's worried about the value of a college education, a four-year college education, and he thinks some people might be better served not taking out all that debt or focusing more on, on a skill of being a plumber, being a landscaper. Um, but that's, that, that's look, you know, the big picture is this is the Elizabeth Warren coalition. Elizabeth Warren was one of the key senators that was in Biden's ear that was really lobbying for, for this forgiveness. Uh, you saw how Elizabeth Warren did politically in the presidential campaign. She, I, mean, I don't even think she finished in the top two in any, any state. Uh, she doesn't have a whole lot of political, uh, you know, electoral influence being from Massachusetts, but she has a lot of staffers, a lot of people that share her very progressive worldview that are serving in this White House. And that influence made the difference, I think, in the end, that that, that influence pushed Biden to forgive more loans and really lean into this in a way that a lot of other Democrats are having problems with. You know, it could be $40,000 for people who are going off. I, I read the Financial Times story on the new starting salaries at McKinsey, Bain, and the Boston Consulting Group. And they are going to make between $179,000 and $192,000 for sure. And their bonuses in the first year, which will be next year, they go to work in September or October. Their first year, and some of them come in in December, they'll get $40,000. A married couple who had Pell Grants would get $40,000. And then they will make that married couple $400,000. And it will not matter because their AGI for 2022 will be below $250,000 combined. It's astonishing, Josh. So this goes to the blue bubble. I think Susan Rice sits atop the domestic policy apparatus. I believe she is to the left of left and that everyone working for her is to the left of the left. Ron Klain, I thought, was more centrist, but I don't know that he has time for this. Does anyone there speak for moderate America in the White House? Yeah, I mean, there are uh, advisors to, to the president that are that are more on the, on the center side, but uh, in the end, Biden, I mean, uh, according to some of the, the, the reporting, uh, Kamala Harris, I don't know how much influence she has, but she was very vocal in favor of, of this move, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Ron Klain, I, I, you know, all my reporting suggests that he, he has favored the more progressive side of the party on a whole number of, of, of fights, uh, starting from Build Back Better and, and, and the multi-trillion dollar spending proposal to this as well. So, you know, I, I, the problem is that the progressive side is more vocal. The, 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 the moderate side, um, you know, does, doesn't feel... It, 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 when you look at the history of this Biden presidency, it feels like they have successes. Like Biden wins the, the presidency, has, has a big coalition, and then steps on himself by trying to, you know, be, be historic and, you know, do, do all these multi-trillion dollar proposals for spending. This was the bet, one of the best weeks of the Biden presidency in getting a bunch of bipartisan legislation passed. He won the special election in New York. And yet... This steps all over those accomplishments. And he adds in semi-fascist, which I think is in with basket of deplorables. Agree or disagree, Josh? Yeah, I, I think if the White House had it to do over again, they, they would probably tone down that that rhetoric. I, from what I understand, that was not on the teleprompter. It was uh, uh, improvised in, in, in the president's speech. But look, um, yeah, that, that only fires up the base. That only makes the opposition uh, work harder to, to go against your party. So, yeah, I don't think that was a smart political move either. Josh Crosshour, the center fielder of American politics. We need, a, you know, the catcher is Brett Bear. We need a second baseman up the middle. And in center field is Josh Crosshour. Thank you, Josh. Follow him on Twitter at Josh Crosshour.